So today for our second chef, we're so proud to have uh, Cameron Luark. And I want to make a note here. Anytime you work with a chef, such as you, many of you did he, this weekend, uh, this last week, w make sure, A, you learn their name, B, you learn how to pronounce it correctly, and C, at some point, get their card. Because you never know when you might need them again. And they might remember your face, and there might be a job in it for you. Cameron Lewick was drawn to cooking at an early age, like so many of us. He would prepare dinner nightly for his mom and his older brother. As a child, he would experiment with basic recipes and try to recreate them into new culinary creations. His passion for cooking and old-fashioned hard work got him to where he is today as executive chef at Spago at the Four Seasons Maui. Okay, Spago, somebody, who is his boss? His top boss, who is his top boss? Thank you, Wolfgang Puck. At 17, he walked into Wolfgang Puck's then Malibu restaurant, Granita, wanting to cook and was hired on the spot. Working under the direction of Chef Puck and managing partner and corporate executive Chef Lee Hefter, Lewark worked with grueling determination and drive to accomplish his goal of becoming an executive chef by age 30. That means quite a few of you only have about 10 years to beat him. Following his time at Granita, Lewark moved to Wolfgang Puck's Cafe as a line cook, another opportunity to learn and become a step closer to his goal. After proving his dedication and earning uh, Wolfgang's trust and confidence, Lewark was transferred to Spago Beverly Hills, uh, which is Puck's uh, flagship restaurant. That's the first one that went in. It was here that Lewark's true talents were nurtured and groomed, and after four years there, and mastering every station there, he was offered the head sous chef position at Spago Maui when it opened at 2001. I had the best pasta of my life at their press opening. His continued motivation and strive for excellence led him to the head chef position in 2005, accomplishing his dream of becoming an executive chef before turning 30. Lurk was 29 years old at that time. At Spago Maui, he uses Hawaii Island's fresh produce, fish, and meats to create elegantly prepared masterpieces with the innovative style that has made Spago famous. The menu changes daily, utilizing only the freshest and finest ingredients available and embracing the traditions of the islands and featuring Puck's classics as well. You have to understand the clientele at the Four Seasons. For them, Spago is like their neighborhood restaurant and they expect to find there the quality that they find back in California, and they do because of Chef. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so everyone can hear me fine? All right, great. Well, thank you for having me, and I uh, just appreciate the opportunity to talk, talk to you today. So believe it or not, it's my first uh, little demo, so you have to bear with me while we, I don't know, make mistakes or whatever. So we're here to talk about Thai food, okay? If you look at Thailand, it's a very big country, correct? Um, there's so many different influences in, in, in Thai food. So you have northwest, east, south. Um, we'll talk about north a little bit. North, um, northern Thai... Thai food, believe it or not, you know, there, if you look at it geographically, northern Thailand is full of rolling hills and mountain region. It's a mountain region north. Um, it's actually the Himalayas start in Thailand. So Himalayas, tall mountains, right? So if you think about geographically, you have to look at what food comes from that geographic area. So there's no coconut trees or any coconut palms anything like that in northern Thai so they don't use coconut milk believe it or not a lot of people that I come in contact with my guests they really think that throughout Thailand oh it's just coconut milk coconut milk coconut milk <clears throat> believe it or not they don't use coconut milk in northern Thai so that's one thing I wanted to mention to you we're gonna focus on Southern Thai, and we're going to talk about using, making some curries. So I'm going to teach you two, two curries that are so easy. 
I, my idea to show you guys today was to do something that you can do at home and something that you can do it on a Friday night or you can do it in the highest restaurant you can ever come, come in contact with. So I guess we'll start with the red curry. And because we're using, like, using Southern Thai as a, our platform today, um, I'm going to have everyone have a recipe. I don't know where they are, but we're going to pass them out. Um, we can, someone can pass them out for me. That would be great. So because of a limited time, I'm going to kind of cut this recipe a little bit. I'm going to kind of wing it, if you will. But if you follow the steps as written, very easy, very, very easy curry, but with such flavor and, and, and just a lot of depth. So we're going to start with the red curry. Oh, let me get, see if I can get this thing on. There we go. Okay, so in Thailand there's a, there's a sauce called Nam Pla. Nam Pla is probably the most versatile sauce they use in Thailand. Okay, and it is throughout southern, northern, eastern, western. They use Nam Pla everywhere. Okay, Nam Pla, you don't have a recipe for it, but it's really easy to remember. What we use at Spago, or what I use at Spago, it's equal parts of these ingredients. So if you have a pen and paper, it's a great, great recipe to write down. Um, I didn't want to show it to you because it's really super easy. It's equal parts fish sauce, water, Um, rice wine vinegar and sugar all equal parts okay so with the addition of chopped garlic and Thai chilies you have Nam Pla okay this is a, a a dish that or a sauce that they use everywhere and anywhere to finish finish any kind of sauce they put it on as a condiment I mean the way I would look at it it is something that the Americans would use is, is like ketchup, you know. It's their ketchup. So, Nam Pla is a very, very important thing to know, and that's, it's super easy to make. Equal parts with some chopped garlic and Thai chilies, okay. We'll get back to where we're going to put that in the recipe. Um, so, let's start with the curry, okay. Very easy. We're going to start with peanut oil. Obviously, we're always going to use peanut oil because there's not a lot of olives in Thailand, so that's pretty simple. Um, most Asian food, they always use uh, peanut oil for several reasons. Um, definitely easy to cultivate, and um, like I, I said, olives don't grow there. And very clean. You can use um, vegetable oil if you don't have peanut oil. You can even use olive oil, but some olive oils don't have that clean flavor, you know, then you're going to tend into the, I don't know if you've tasted the difference of olive oils, depending on where they come from. There's so many different tastes from, from the olive oil. So you want a, a clean, clean olive oil or peanut oil that doesn't have any flavor. It's going to mess with what we're trying to do here. So what we have is uh, Thai basil, kaffir lime leaves, galangal, or ginger. If you're looking at your recipe, it says or. I use both, okay? Number, a couple very important things when you're using these ingredients or let alone any ingredients that you're gonna cook with, okay? I, I pre-prepped all this stuff so it would be easy for me up here. Whenever you're using ginger in any kind of sauce or anything, you're gonna, you're gonna whack it, okay? You wanna smash ginger, you wanna beat it. I mean, you want to take the back of your knife or, or some kind of back of a pan or a pot and just whack it. I mean, take your big pieces of ginger and just whack it until you start seeing juice come off onto your cutting board. When, that, when you start seeing the juice and the, come off the cutting board, then you cut it up and rough chop it. That also goes with the galangal. Okay, galangal is a staple in Thailand. Um, it's, it, some people call it Thai ginger. Um, if you're not familiar with galangal, it's, it's a Thai ginger and the only way I can describe the flavor of galangal is it's very metallic 
And when I tell my new cooks, anyone um, take a battery when they were a kid and touch it on top of their tongue? Right? Kind of that metallic, tingling. That's what, what it reminds me of. And we all have different palates, but that's kind of something that what I teach. It has this metallic, very fragrant, very deep flavor. So we're going to heat up our pan pretty hot with our oil. We're going to add all of our ingredients. Okay, and it's really important that we... You can hear the, that liquid kind of pop the oil. You want to be careful with that. But that's what you want. You want that ginger and galangal juice to, to hit the pan, all the oils to break out. Be careful because if you're using a saute pan, that might flame up on you and catch on fire. So right now we have the kefir lime. The, or the kefir lime is next. Is everybody familiar with kefir lime? So if you're not, I'm going to pass it around. You guys want to pass some around? So a couple of the people in front. Whenever you're using any kind of herb or any kind of kefir lime, anything, any herb, period. And no matter what you're using it for, how, cooking, there's a saying for herbs. If you don't bruise it, don't use it. Don't even bother throwing thyme in a sauce unless you bruise it. Okay, you need to release all of those oils that are in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put it in my hands and I'm going to bruise it up and put it in the pot. Now, the natural color of kefir lime leaf is more Definitely more green. I mean, um, interesting story. I, I went into my hotel and I put my, all my ingredients in my uh, refrigerator that they provided me. And it froze everything. So my kefir lime leaves got frozen. But it's a good lesson there. There's no, it just loses color. If you're, if it's, sometimes it's hard to, in, in Maui to get some kefir lime leaves. So you can always buy a whole bunch of it and freeze it. You're not going to want to garnish with it, but you're never going to lose the flavor. So it's really important that you bruise everything that uh, you use in a pot. I also brought a kefir lime that I want you to all look at. If you get a chance, you want to scratch it with your fingernail and then smell it. You want to pass that around? So they're an ugly lime. You want to pass that one around too? It's a very ugly and bitter lime, okay? It's very wrinkly. It, it has a lot of juice, but it's not something that is very palatable. Um, kefir lime leaf can be really, really bitter. So if you want to use the juice, you want to use it in combination of regular lime juice with, I, I use, and, and I'm not kidding, I use about 90% lime juice to 10% kefir lime juice. It is so powerful and too bitter. It's, you don't, you really don't want to use it. <clears throat> and it's full. It's a good thing to finish with, like just to squeeze a couple drops on something that we're going to do today. But just a, a side note um, on kefir lime. So after we sweat it, we're going to sweat the, uh, what I call the aromatics. Um, until they get a little fragrant, right? You want to be able to smell them. You don't want to cook it too hot, just until it's getting fragrant, right? <clears throat> After that, we're going to add in curry paste. Okay, curry paste. Now, in front of you, this is store-bought curry paste. It's a good product. It's my ploy. You can get it in any Asian market, um, here in Hawaii at least. I mean, if you live in the middle of America, you're not going to find it. Um, so we're going to add it in. What this is, is, um, gosh, a bunch of uh, chilies, garlic, um, ginger. And they basically, when you're in a home kitchen in Thailand, they, they, make them, um, they make them in a mortar and pestle. So at Spago, we make it with a mortar and pestle. And I have my prep cooks do it because it's a very long and tedious, tedious job. And one of my new people, culinary students, or, or people that just um, <clears throat> start working for me get that, that job. Um, so you can, if you really want, and um, 
I must encourage it. If you make the curry paste in a mortar and pestle in your home, and you make the same dish side by side, and you use the store-bought or the stuff that you make at home, I'm telling you, it is a massive difference. And you can use the same ingredients, the same ounces, the same weight of everything, but you're using, just because of that mortar and pestle, I'm telling you, it, it, you'll, it's from dynamite to, you know, just good. So what we're gonna do is sweat the uh, curry paste, and we'll talk about the curry paste a little bit later too. Um, with this, it's just like blooming um, tomato paste. I'm sure you've learned about blooming tomato paste. You just wanna get in a pan, you wanna smoke it out. You wanna <clears throat> get all those oils working and um, caramelizing and starting to uh, develop their flavors. After that, we're gonna add some paprika. Everybody knows what paprika is. Now the paprika is just for color. Paprika, I use Hungarian sweet paprika for this dish. Um, it's mild, it doesn't have too much spice. Because um, I don't want to add more spice because of the, the chilies and the curry paste have enough, enough, spa enough spice. So after that, we're going to add two quarts of coconut milk and I'm not going to add two quarts. I'm just going to get it going because I don't think we have enough time. So after we incorporate this, we want to bring it up to a simmer and we want to bring this down. And the most important thing, and I don't think we'll be able to do it here, but I'll try, is with this curry, the most important thing you do with coconut milk, because if you look down in your recipe, you're going to add a little more coconut milk later. So what we want to do is take this coconut milk, we want to almost break it. So everyone's probably broken a vinaigrette before, it's separated, you don't know what to do. But with coconut milk, you want to bring it down so tight to like the almost second that it's about to pop. And when, that's when the fats all separate from the solids, right? So I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but it's a very key part of this sauce. So when you do it at home or in a restaurant environment or even here at school, you want to be patient with it, you want to bring it down, you want to constantly stir it because it will, because of its, its thick nature, it'll start burning and kicking down on the bottom so you want to constantly stir it. But you want to bring that sauce down to like, and it takes some time, you're going to make it a few times to understand because when it breaks, it's okay to break it. You know, you don't have to throw the sauce away, you can fix it, it's very easy. But the where you want to get the most flavor is right at that moment, right at that second that it's about to pop. And it's going to separate because you're bringing down the fats and you want to make those fats very palatable and that brings out the most flavor of the dish and the coconut milk. Most coconut milks that you buy are going to be kind of watered down. They're going to have some additives in it because you know they have to put those in there to be in a can. I mean, unless you're making your own coconut milk, I mean, awesome if you are, but uh, no one's really doing that in a restaurant environment. So, all right, that's what we're, we're doing with the, the red curry. We're gonna bring it down until it's broken. Because of time, like I said, I'm not gonna be able to do that. After that, we're gonna add the rest of the coconut milk. If you, if you look on your recipe, you have two more quarts of coconut milk, <clears throat> which we're gonna add. <clears throat> Okay, we're gonna bring that to a boil and then we're gonna add the rest of the ingredients, okay? The rest of the ingredients I have is the sugar, four cups. It's a lot of sugar, isn't it? I don't know if you guys know, but most Asian food, or probably all Asian food, they use sugar as we would use salt, okay? Most every dish that you're ever going to work with, which, with Asian food, has sugar in it in one form or not. Okay, Thailand they use palm sugar. Okay, they take palm sugar and it comes in these big bricks. I mean, just 50, 20, 30 pound bricks. However, the company makes it, and then they break it down. And you can just go to the store in Thailand. You buy just a, you know, a brick of uh, palm sugar. It looks like uh, a light brown sugar 
that um, is really hard. Have you ever left, uh, probably not in Hawaii, but if you live in a dry climate, brown sugar gets really hard and feels like a brick. It's kind of like palm sugar. But with palm sugar, you take that brick and you boil it with equal parts water, and you make a simple syrup. And then you add it to each dish as needed. Um, because I didn't want to bring down palm sugar, and I had to, because of the long process, we're using straight, straight sugar. Sugar goes in, and we're pretty much done. Now all we have to do is the second reduction, <clears throat> and we're going to let those those flavors come together. We're going to bring it down by half at this point, okay? Does anyone have questions so far? I mean, it's, it's a really easy, easy recipe, something that you can really do at home. Yes, ma'am? For sugar, sure. Any other sugar substitute will work. I mean, I'm not here to tell you to use sugar all the time or palm sugar. It's what about, you know, it depends who you're cooking for, who your guests are. Very important to know your client base. I mean, as a restaurant tour or somebody, you have to know your restaurant base. Good question, because if she's cooking for people that are, have a certain diet, maybe heart problems, or they might be, they just might be, they don't want to eat sugar. You never know. I mean, you can use any kind of sugative additive. Now, it's going to totally change the dynamic of the sauce because of just the chemistry doesn't mean that it's going to be wrong you know it's to your liking so you can use any substitute is your question um, anything else I'm using Thai chilies okay so in Thailand there's so many different chilies I mean I could just sit up here and I could probably spend a lifetime studying the chilies from Thailand I mean in a lifetime no matter what food you're studying you'll never ever be able to learn or know everything about that that type of food so I personally use Thai chilies it's very easy for me to get them on on Maui and more importantly I grow them in my own garden so I like the I know where they come from um, I have a garden at home and I I have kefir limes I have everything that you can imagine in my garden because I don't know I'm very passionate about gardening so um, kefir lime I don't have ginger or anything like that, but any herb, any small vegetable, I do it. I have about two, I don't know, a thousand, thousand square feet of a garden. So Thai chilies are, are to get to your question, um, Thai chilies are something that I love to use. Very spicy, small, they come in green or red. Um, just be careful when you use them. Um, obviously, you want to wear gloves. Uh, you never want to touch your eyes and stuff like that, but it's a good lesson to learn when you cut and touch your eye. You never do it again. So, all right, so there's the curry, red curry. Yeah. Good question. It's very simple. You just add more coconut milk, okay? All of that flavor, as long as you didn't char and burn that bottom, okay? Because sometimes if you reduce it too far, the reason why you did it is you walked away and you weren't paying attention and you crusted it and it gets on the bottom and it just gets char and black. So normally if you broke it, it's gonna happen like that, but if you do over reduce it, you're just gonna add a little more coconut milk. You wanna boil it again. You wanna maybe half the time that you would normally bring it down and it'll come right back. It'll snap right back into great flavor. And <clears throat> there are some Thai dishes that continuously want you wanting to break the coconut milk depending on what you're making. Um, some chefs will break more coconut milk, break it, add more coconut milk, break it, and then they'll keep on doing it just to add so much flavor to the, um, the dish. Green curry, very different. Going back to the mortar and pestle, you're going to take, I'll just kind of run over what's in the mortar and pestle. You have green, green Thai chilies, probably some other chili, maybe a, a, like a um, jalapeno, a green jalapeno, kefir lime, you'll have lime zest, you'll probably have cumin and coriander, um, lemongrass, um, Thai basil, all of it's rough chopped and then put in that big mortar and pestle and everyone's seen a big mortar and pestle, right? They come in all sizes. Um, you know, the one I have at, at work is about this big and someone's just sitting there. It's almost like pound and poi or something. It's not the 
the funnest thing, but what you get in the end is amazing. So basically, you get all those ingredients. Um, I would say equal parts. If you want it really, really spicy, bump up the chili. It's something that you should do on your own and experiment with. And that's something that I, I, you're, that I promote to my, my cooks and my chefs, that they have to go home and experiment and do what you like. You always want to follow the recipe, but once you've nailed that recipe, you want to, you know, change it because you want that recipe. The recipe in your hands, I want you, in 10 years, I want you to take this adaptation of my recipe and then you have your own recipe, right? So that's why you should keep every recipe that you get. Um, so mortar and pestle, and you're going to make a green curry paste. It's green because of the kefir lime, the um, Thai basil, there's some garlic in there. And then usually we take some of that sauce, the non plat, and I'll put it in the mortar and pestle just so it's a little easier to work because it gets a little clumpy. Um, this sauce is almost the same sauce. Um, very similar. It has a few different ingredients, um, but it's the same process. Everything's you're going to sweat. It starts with, you know, you're sweating your ingredients. And you're going to start the same process. You're going to use the same oil. Um, let me grab my recipe here. This recipe is a little different. We have a, a little cumin. Um, in Thailand, they use a lot of spices, um, of course. But most of Thailand, southern Thailand, again, going back to the geographics, um, southern Thailand is very tropical. Uh, many different islands that we could talk about, hundreds and thousands of islands. That, but Southern Thailand has the, that coconut milk. It's very um, similar in, um, I guess, kind of like Hawaii. Um, lots of palm. You can grow anything there. So a lot of the curries are based on fresh ingredients. And then when you talk about other curries, when you go into India um, and they talk about their curries, you know, they don't use a lot of coconut milk depending on where they are in India. If there's southern India, again, it's all about geographics. There's a lot of coconut milk. There's a lot of things that they can grow down there. But up in the desert area, what are the, they can't grow anything, so they have a lot of spices. So the difference between two curries um, from India and, and Thailand is mainly that fresh ingredient. So in India, you have a lot of spices, dried spices compared to Thai when you have, you're using fresh ingredients that, with a little bit of spice. So again, we're going to add the ginger. Did anyone remember what we did with the ginger? Anyone? Smashed it, right? It's absolutely imperative that you smash ginger whenever you use it for any kind of sauce or you're trying to bring out its all, all of its raw flavors. Again, we're going to take our herbs, we're going to bruise it. Normally these are greener, but again, you're not going to lose any flavor because they're frozen. Lemongrass, we all know we're familiar with lemongrass. Same process. Smash it, smash it, smash it, smash it. You have to smash it. It's such, it's such a dense um, lemongrass. Lemongrass is so dense, you want to be able to, to really break it down and release those oils. Another thing that no one really knows that I do a lot is if you take lemongrass, and this is just kind of a side note, if you take the middle of, it's not very palatable, you can't really eat lemongrass, but if you cut it in half and actually find the heart, I prefer the bigger lemongrass, the smaller lemongrass, it's harder to get to, but it's more tender with the smaller lemongrass, but you can get the heart and you can just eat it. You can chop it up, you can use it as a garnish. It's a great, great thing. Not, not a lot of people eat raw lemon glass like that, but I do it all the time. I garnish all my dishes with raw lemon grass. Has a very unique, beautiful flavor. So we're gonna add all our ingredients again. This is, this is just to cumin, right out of the, the can or the box. Now it's important when you add the cumin that you wanna toast it, right? Toasting cumin. I mean, if you're up here, it instantly starts to smell like cumin. But it's important that you get a good toast on your cumin. I don't know if you guys can smell it, but it's really fragrant up here. Okay. Thai chilies. And then I use uh, the red ones in here are Hawaiian red chilies. And you see I backed away from that because I don't want to cry. <laughs> it 
So they're pretty good Thai chilies, I can tell. Again, green curry paste that we just talked about. <laughs> and then we're going to do the whole process again. We're going to add coconut milk. And we're going to bring it down. We're going to break it. Over here, I guess my... Uh, you know, I might have run out of gas. You know, little chef, you want to um, hook me up with some gas? <clears throat> I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or... Has anyone traveled to Thailand? Has anyone, does anyone have, have, <clears throat> where have you been? <clears throat> Beautiful country. Incredible, incredible. Some of the best food that you'll ever find in this world is in Thailand. Um, thank you. Like when I, <clears throat> when everyone goes there and they go eat, if they're really foodies and they really eat right, they're not afraid of the water, they're not afraid to eat, and I don't know about you, but when, I, <clears throat> when we came back, I, I smelled like garlic. Like I sweated garlic and I almost sweated like a, a spicy chili. Like it was kind of weird, but they put so much of those ingredients. You have garlic, you have chilies, the kaffir lime leaf and the Thai basil, lemongrass. Those are like so predominant in this, this region of the world. Now, I wish I could pick up and live in the jungle somewhere in Thailand, but of course I have a family to take care of, or a soon to be a family. Can't do that, I don't think my wife would like that. Um, <clears throat> great, so this is up to a boil again. Both dishes I serve in my restaurant. I do uh, two different things. Um, with this curry, you can do so much stuff, and that's kind of why I chose this, these, these dishes. And I wanted to show you guys that how versatile curry can be. Now, when you're all done, you have these bases done. We'll call them curry bases. There is hundreds and hundreds of things that you can do with this. I mean, you can keep it cold. You can put it in a, you can drop a, you take a motion blender. You take, a, I don't know, like two egg yolks, maybe a, a cup of the curry. Emulsify that together and then throw in some peanut oil. Emulsify it, you have a green curry vinaigrette. Very simple. If you want to add depth to that, you're going to add more layers of flavors. So you would add, what, lemongrass? You could add chopped up hearts of lemongrass. You can add galangal and fresh ginger. Even some Japanese ginger would be great to bring out the flavors. <clears throat> um, so that would be a, a great, like a Thai salad, maybe marinate some shrimp, boil them off, put some nam pla on the shrimp, dress some greens and put the, you know, the, the nam pla shrimp. I mean, it, it's endless. That's just one I just came up with right now. I don't know. I'm just thinking outside of the box here. Um, what we do at, at, at Spago, I take uh, any kind of local fish, whatever we're getting, I, I cube it, maybe like the size of my finger, same size. I'll season it or marinate it. I normally marinate it in green, what, what we call green aromatics, ginger, garlic, green onions, peanut oil, and chili flakes. And then when I will tempura batter the fish. Everybody probably you can go buy a tempura batter at the store. Um, very simple. Tempura, deep fry it. <clears throat> we lay it, we cool it down. Well, we don't cool it. While it's hot, we will saute mushrooms, uh, Maui onions, and some fresh tomatoes and Thai basil and some garlic. And then we put it on the plate and we take that um, fried fish, the tempura, we put it on the bed of vegetables I just made. And um, we take this curry sauce, we reduce it down, throw a little butter on it and put it on the dish. That's one small appetizer that we do. That's what's on the menu right now. Um, if you, are interested, uh, you can always go to our website, wolfgangpuck.com, and, and, and kind of check out my restaurant. Uh, 
<clears throat> I had some pictures for you, but I guess we're not going to put up some pictures. But All right, so now this one's looking good because that one's down. <clears throat> this coconut milk's almost close to breaking. I mean, so when you're looking at it, to know it's about to break, it's just like uh, any kind of vinaigrette, you know, it starts to shine. You know, you're adding too much olive oil, you're going too fast in some kind of vinaigrette, uh, or your <clears throat> hollandaise or your bernays sauce. Um, it's just getting sheen. You can almost see your reflection on it. At that point, you know it's about to snap. So <clears throat> right here, we're getting really close. Now some coconut milk you'll never be able to, to break because of all the uh, additives they put in it. But we're there. We're going to add the coconut milk. And pretty much we are <clears throat> almost done. At this point, I'm going to season it. Because this one, <clears throat> I'm going to season it with my salt and pepper down here. Yeah, well, I did not. Yeah, I don't have them. I don't have them. Um, here. Um, so I'm going to season it. I'm going to add a little sugar again. And then we're going to let it go. We, we got maybe 10 minutes on this sauce. And uh, we'll be done. After all these sauces are done, we're going to chinois them. And that's where I'm going to take you next because of time. Again, I would reduce, um, from this point, I would reduce uh, both curries by half, okay? It's very simple. Again, make this at home. Be a rock star. Husband, boyfriend, girlfriend. You're going to make them very happy. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to do is maybe, um, you want to come and help me? <clears throat> What's your name again? Aaron. Aaron. Again, thank you very much. Um, so, Aaron, you're going to help me out and just uh, get involved here. Um, we'll just take some of this. Let's use the red curry. You want to just uh, start ladling. And then when it's a little easier to pick up, we'll just dump it in there, all right? Okay. And just force it through. When you're doing the chinois, you're going to chinois it. Um, Obviously, you want to be careful. That's why I'm having him take some of the weight away from it. You always want to be smart and safe. If you take some of the weight away from it, it's easier to get rid of. Um, <clears throat> once we have that done, we're going to um, start creating the dish. The, the, the dish at Spago is, it, that we have right now running on the menu, and we run it all the time, is uh, red curry. Uh, we call it like a Hawaiian fish with red curry. Um, again, I take any kind of fish. And the reason why I came up with this dish is because when I butcher and I, have, I do all my prep in the kitchen, I'm always left with leftover pieces. And um, you know, I would look at my butcher and I'd, I'd be like, well, you know, I'd look in, the, in, the, in the, <clears throat> the trash can and I would see like, the way I look at it, because I'm an owner of Spago, I mean, you're throwing away money. When you throw away anything that's usable, it's like taking your money and throwing it away. And that's how you have to look at it. If you want to be a really good operator, not only a good chef, but a good operator, and that's what I think you're, at least my own, my, my goal, my first goal was to be a chef, and my second goal would be a good operator. You don't want to throw away anything, right? That's the most important thing. If you're wasting money in your restaurant, you're losing money and you're not making money and you're going to, run, you're going to fail your restaurant. Um, I think you all know that restaurants are probably one of the hardest things to open. Their fail rate is astronomical. I don't even know what it is. It's probably around 80%. Does anyone know the fail rate of any restaurants? It's somewhere, I would guess, in 80% of every restaurant across the board fails. And this is probably why. So I created this dish because one day my, I looked in the trash can and my butcher was throwing away fish. So to make money, to become a good operator, I created a dish for those scraps. It's very important to make money from waste. If you can make money from waste, you're going to be a rock star, I promise. So we marinated the, last, the little chunks, any kind of scraps, anything 
and um, some ginger and garlic. And what we do, good Aaron, you gonna be okay? Yeah, wait, wait, wait. You always wanna, sorry, we can turn that off. I don't know if you saw that, but Aaron was about to dump towards himself. Okay, we never want to dump something towards ourselves because just in case it falls or you make a, you know, it's all right, there's nothing wrong with that. So you want to dump it away from you because if you do make that mistake, it's going to land on someone else. <laughs> Hopefully not, but um, not yourself. And that was a joke, please. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. Just take it. So you want to, good job, great job, Aaron. So I'll, I'll, you go ahead and dump it in there and I'll push it through. So. It's important that you push this through. That's fine, Aaron. Uh, you can put that right under. We're done. So, Aaron, you want to just keep on pushing that through? Yep. So it's important when you push it through that you're mashing that ginger, that garlic, that uh, all those uh, lovely aromatics. So when he gets down, I'm going to make him push and push and push because that's, you know, there's so much flavor in there. You want to push it into your sauce. So getting back to the dish. Um, marinated fish. Tonight, today we're actually going to do uh, pork or chicken. Again, going back to how versatile these dishes are, um, you can use any protein. You can use anything that you like to eat. Um, it, it would work with fried tofu. Um, anything you can come up with. Ground beef, ground anything, ground chicken, anything. It'll work with anything you use, anything you like. That's why how, that's versatile. So today I brought chicken and pork, but I think for both dishes we're going to use pork because um, a couple of the other chefs are going to use chicken too. So I don't want to uh, overkill chicken. Um, again, I would normally at, at the restaurant do the same dish we're about to do right here, but with fish. And because I got here a few days earlier, I didn't want to bring uh, fish because it would have been three days old. So in here we have some just uh, uh, pork loin, Ch cubed pork loin. You know, you can get it anywhere, Costco. Um, and I have it marinated in something called green aromatics. I went over it. It's the three G's, ginger, garlic, green onions. Um, we're going to heat up a pan. This one, this pan's going to be really nice and, and hot and spicy. I'm going to push that real good. Um, so with the pork, you want to um, season it with uh, salt and pepper. You always want to season your food. Um, I use black pepper in all Asian food. Um, I'm going to use black pepper. It's pretty much a rule in my kitchen. If you are cooking any type of Asian food, um, it's going to be black pepper. So this one's about done too, so I'm going to turn that one off. And I'm going to have Aaron do the same thing with the green curry. That's perfect. So you want to put that, I'll take that. So if you stay up here, I'm going to have you um, do that same thing with the, uh, the green curry right into there, okay? So hot pan, I'm throwing in my uh, pork. We're just going to sear the pork and get it pretty much uh, nice and caramelized. While this caramelizes, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Uh huh. Wow, I don't know the conversion of the bot, but it, I mean, this, the, I would imagine it would be probably maybe two American dollars. So, her question was the Morden Pestle, she got one about yay big, and how much it would cost 
in Thailand. Because of the exchange rate, um, two dollars tops. Um, so while we're caramelizing this pork chop, uh, this might come to a, a little surprise to you, but what we're going to do is I'm going to add sugar to it. Okay, I'm going to add a pinch of sugar to the pork chop. Okay, what that's going to do is not only bring out some caramelization, it's going to really help that that pork get nice and, and caramelized. And it's going to add that deep sweetness that I'm looking for in my dish. Um, while you're doing this, any veg, any veg you love. Okay, at the restaurant we use hearts of palm and carrots. I add some snap peas and some pineapple because um, we call it like a, a little gimmicky thing, pineapple red curry. Um, you know, all the people that aren't from Hawaii, they love that. Um, now, in the beginning, uh, she was talking to you about um, the Four Seasons guests. Um, I happen to work in a restaurant, and even though I'm a chef and I, I'm a part owner of that restaurant, I can never say no. Um, there is absolutely, it, it's just a, not only is it a Wolfgang trait, we just don't say no to people. Um, and and it, it's taken me a long time to understand why, when I was younger in my career, I would be the bitter cook, like, why do I have to make this? Why do I have to go on a walk-in and make them Italian food when we're, we're an Asian restaurant? You know, I, I don't get it. But again, when I go back to getting, getting back to becoming a good operator, if you don't say no ever to anybody, do you think they'll come back? You've just made, by saying that someone comes in and they say, well, you have all Asian food. Uh, can I just get, you know, some bolognese or something along that line? And you say yes, you just made a customer for life, period. They will always remember that you made them bolognese. They're not stupid. They, they you know, they know that you don't have it or they know, they know, but you just made a guess. And, and what about being a good operator is um, being able to continuously make people happy. And that goes in the front of the house. If anyone's working in the front of the house, I don't know. Anyone want interest in the front of the house? Rules. You never let anyone leave the restaurant unhappy. Period. Okay, if they leave unhappy with this digital age, they're gonna, you're going to find out. You're going to look on Twitter. You're going to look on, like, they're unhappy. And they're, they're going to, what are those websites? I don't know what they are. Trip is, uh, nah, I don't know. Anyone help me out? The websites where they can tell you about your restaurant or, Yelp. yeah, Yelp. So you go on Yelp and you'll be like, all right, I asked for bolognese and they said, no, I'll never go back. I would never go back to Spago. So you want to avoid that. And um, so if you, you're up here, if you look up here, I don't know if you can, but you're getting a, a deep caramelization and almost a crust because of that sugar. Um, and that's what you want. So we're almost there. We're gonna drain some of the oil out and back to the veg. I keep on going off topic. Any veg you want, doesn't matter. Bok choy, any kind of Asian flair. Uh, it's a pork loin, okay? Um, I have the, uh, because I work where I do and I'm very fortunate, I'm able to source out um, what I think some of the best ingredients are in the world and I, I'm fortunate to, to work with a, a great farmer, two farmers in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Amish. Everybody know who the Amish are? I have this great Amish, thank you Aaron, I appreciate that. Um, a great Amish family in Pennsylvania that, that will raise uh, pork and they raise duck for me too. So I have them send me pork and duck. Um, all the way from Pennsylvania. Um, kind of a neat thing. Veg goes in, and all we do, I mean, this is it. I mean, the dish is done. So we're gonna add our curry. And all we're gonna do is bring it down into a, a nice, nice glaze. Um, let me see if I have my, my spoon. You always should have a spoon in your back pocket. Anybody? I mean, no matter what, you should have a spoon in your back pocket. So, all that sugar and all that curry is going to caramelize. 
and it's going to be a nice, beautiful glaze. Um, so what I'll do here is I'll, I'm going to always taste. Um, you always want to taste your food, right? So I think the sugar's good. We're going to add just finishing touches of some sugar. Um, and there, I had some fish sauce that I don't know if I had it up here, but we would, at this point, I would add um, some nampla, what we were talking about earlier. Like I said, we're going to finish the nampla, finish with nampla, and we're going to go straight to the plate. Nampla, because of the fish sauce, um, it's basically going to have some salt. And again, it's wago, it's curry. It's a fish curry, and I'll pass this around. Again, I'm not making a, everybody some, but maybe you can come up here and, and try it. Um, yeah, sure. Can you talk a little bit about Hawaii Rising Star Chefs? Sure. What that process was? Okay, so just to finish the dish, we're gonna, um, I don't know where my kaffir lime leaves, uh, leaves are or my lemons, but I'm just gonna take my uh, lemon and, or lime and just kind of squeeze it over there and then we're going to garnish you know with some just some fresh herbs and then uh, again you can take some kaffir lime leaf again some people don't think that kaffir lime leaf is very palatable uh, if you eat it and chew on its top tart it's hard to digest but if you julienne it very very fine as fine as you can as fine as like human hair very sharp knife you will be able to uh, eat it, it's very palatable, and you want to take out the, the rib of that kaffir lime leaf, all right? So, Rising Chefs, um, I was absolutely honored and blown away. Um, I always wanted to be a chef. I wrote a, in fourth grade, I wrote a, uh, what do you want to do in life? My mom has it framed. It's hanging up in her. <laughs> it's hanging up as all we all, all moms do things like this. It's hanging up in her house. And in fourth grade, I said I want to be a chef. And I did a little paper. It's probably, I don't know, two paragraphs. So I always wanted to be a chef. My mom was very fortunate, or I was fortunate to have a, a great mother. Uh, single mom. She had to work two jobs. She'd go to work at seven. She come home at nine at night, fourth grade. I was hungry, and I would start cooking. And after years of my mom coming home, and I was I was in fourth or fifth grade, I realized how tired she was. And she'd come home at nine, and then she'd cook me dinner, and I didn't think it was fair. <laughs> so um, that's how I started cooking. I'll get a, a choked up if <laughs> I talk about it, but. Wonderful woman, and I always wanted to be a chef. So Rising Chefs, I'm, I'm gonna get to, to the Rising Chefs. When I had an opportunity to work for Wolfgang, I walked in the kitchen, said I wanna cook. The gentleman hired me, but I, he had, to, you know, I had to work for free for a year. I was right out of high school. I worked for free for a year, and I did the absolute worst things you could do in the job because they were good operators. And when you have someone working for free, you're going to make them do the worst and most tedious jobs. Very humbling, but a great opportunity for me. After a year, um, we ended up getting raided by the INS. Lost half our staff, so they started paying me. Um, yeah, and some, unfortunately, so I lost a lot of friends then, but I did get to start getting paid, and it was a, it was a good thing for me. Um, because I worked for free, I couldn't make, I couldn't pay my bills. <laughs> yeah, never mind. My mom sold her house to pay for it. Um, pretty special woman. She sold her house, her dream house, so she could pay my bills. So, getting back to the rising chef, I was, uh, I was uh, in my office in a, Someone called me and said, I'd like to come taste your food. And I'm like, who are you? Uh, what? I'm like, all right, you can come as a guest. I don't know you. I'm from New York. 
I'm, I'm, I'm part of this rising chef thing. I'm like, okay, you're part of this rising chef thing. Great. And I don't know anything about it. So basically, they said they wanted to they come in and, and do a tasting menu. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't really pay attention to it. I planned a nice tasting menu. They came in and I did this great menu, you know, like 10 courses and they did like pictures and stuff like that. And apparently they liked my food so much that they nominated me for Rising Chef. So it's a group that goes around state by state or region by region and um, they actually taste chef's food and they choose you to be a part of this, this amazing group. Um, this group comprised of the best chefs in the, world, in the, in the country. Dan, Daniel Ballou, Thomas Keller, all of those are some, a part of the Rising Chef and their website. They have a great website. Just go to risingstarchef.com, check it out. Um, and when I was no nominated, it was, it was definitely personally one of those awe, awe moments, like I made it. Um, a, a, just a, a really good thing and, and to become a rising chef to me was I don't know it, to me it was like winning the lottery I mean I, I didn't get any money out of it but what I got is they flew me out here and they sh I don't know it, it's just something that something so important that you can't really explain it uh, it's hard for me to talk about it because I'll get choked up and it's just a, it's just a, a great honor and just to be recognized with um, these gentlemen that are about to come talk to you, just to be in the same room as, as them, uh, I, don't, I still don't believe it. Really, I, I don't believe, I, I still go to their restaurants and I, I don't even, I'm like, I don't know if I cook that good of food. So I'm always, I, I'm just blessed to be that, be a rising chef. They flew me out here, they did a great event um, for us. Does anyone have questions before I keep on rambling on? Yes. Right, because I, I, I was going to cut the, remember when I was going to add the non -plot? that was my whole idea of adding the non -plot. So because of my first, the beginning, and I talked about non -plot, normally I would just finish it with that non -plot. If I would have added the fish sauce with, with the recipe, um, it would have been too salty. So, um, like for you guys, I would just add the fish sauce unless you're willing to make the non pla. So, either or. You can do both, but you want to back off some of the recipe. So, what does it say? Uh, two cups of non pla? Or, yeah, so maybe I do one cup and then add a little non pla. So, you guys want to serve this one too or not? Sure. All right, maybe we'll do this. After we're done. Yeah. Some of you are getting. Oh yeah, okay. okay. So we're ready to show some photos of Spago in my lab. Maybe I, wh where is it going to be? And I'll, I'll talk about the photos. Yeah. So we opened in 2001, um, right after 9-11. Very hard time for us to open. Um, I was there as just a sous chef. It was my first man management job. So we're, we're at the Four Seasons. Um, it's a great partnership with the Four Seasons. Um, we have a beautiful restaurant. It has a great view right over the ocean. Um, I brought everybody a card. Um, I'll pass them out later when we're done after all the other chefs are here. So um, everybody can have my card. Um, one thing I, I, I will do, if you email me and you want to ask me a question, I will get back to you, I promise. So I have students at, in Maui writing me you know, hey chef, I tried this, I tried that, what do you think? Take pictures, they send it to me. I'll get back to you eventually. I may not get back to you in a, in a, right away, but eventually I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, okay, so this is the entrance, right? Yeah. Entrance, uh, the whole restaurant's made uh, with zebra wood. I don't know if you know anything about zebra wood. It, it actually looks like this, a zebra. And uh, very expensive, very beautiful wood. Um, the restaurant was designed by Inkstrom, which is a very fine uh, design group out of San Francisco. 
Um, we just revamped the restaurant. Wolfgang's philosophy is to reinvest in each restaurant. Okay, so every five years, we put in, we'll just say we put in a new kitchen every five. The first five years, we put in a new kitchen. The next five years, we put in a new front of the house. And then back and forth, back and forth. So every five years, um, Wolfgang reinvests into his restaurant because obviously the restaurant's doing well. I mean, we wouldn't do that if we weren't doing well. Yes, this is the lounge. Um, we have some great sea anemones up there. It's very beautiful, very colorful, um, very ocean-like. I mean, it doesn't feel like an aquarium, but it kind of has this beautiful kind of vibe to it. How, much, how many seats in the dining room? Dining room. I can, um, so we have a lanai. This is the back room. This is our PDR where we put the uh, private dining room. We can put 80 people in this room for weddings, anything you want, we'll put 80 people. I actually have my wedding reception here, which is a, a, a great room for that. Again, this is still the PDR. Um, we're looking right out of the ocean. The Four Seasons pool ends at the end of that table. So there's a little, you look right, you know, and some guests get to uh, hang out there and watch them swim around the last, like the first seating of the night. Um, this is where, outside on the lanai, this is a covered, we have a huge lanai um, and to get your question, we can sit about 180 people in my restaurant. Um, we try to do two and a half turns a night, um, depending on what time of year it is. Um, say during the busiest time of the year at Christmas, we do 500 dinners. And then um, like right now, we're doing 250. So anywhere from 200 and 500 dinners um, a night. Um, while we're doing that, we can also be doing a, a banquets and stuff like that. Um, anyone? Well, thank you very much for having me. Joey's next, I believe. <laughs>